Well, I'm delighted to uh, be with you, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you're being challenged to embrace design thinking to improve and transform the programs that you run. In the TED Talk 18 minutes that I have, I thought, well, you know, how can I kick this off? And it occurred to me there's a particular individual uh, that everybody in this room should emulate uh, his behavior as you aim to pursue applying this design thinking to your work. Um, and it's none other than this individual. Who do we have here? Jim, Reverend Jim. Jim Ignatowski, the Reverend Jim, or Iggy, as his friends would call him on the TV show, Taxi. Now, Iggy was perhaps the world's worst taxi cab driver. So why on earth would I suggest that you emulate the, his behavior? Well, he was bad, except for this one episode. And for this one episode, he, he, he drew with this intercom system, and he serenaded his passengers with Sinatra tunes. He offered up cheese and crackers, and he gave these captivating tours of New York City. And he became the envy of the garage as he set a record level of fares and tips. Now think about how he did this. He did not do this on the basis of designing and delivering a better taxi cab service. As Greg likes to say, it's not better sameness. He did this on the basis of designing and staging a unique taxi cab experience. Now it's a fictional pioneer. So let's talk about a, a real world pioneer of design experiences. I came across this quote of Daniel Burnham in Midway Airport, up on a wall, being neglected, covered over by some other artifacts. Uh, Daniel Burnham was the, basically the, the chief planner of the footprint of the city of Chicago. And it really is a, quite a quote. He says, and this I give this to you as sort of your aspiration as you pursue design thinking. Make big plans. Aim high and hope and work, remembering that a noble, logical diagram once we're recorded, will not die. And I like to think that I will be long remembered for a single noble logical diagram, all of which I hope you have in the handout from my book, The Experience Economy. It's something we call the progression of economic value. So you've got a, a more detailed handout to, to, to see the, how we frame this. As I'll walk through visually on the screen, really this march of economic history. If you go back 200 years ago, Nearly everybody lived or worked on farms extracting commodities. And extracting that natural stuff was the basis of the agrarian economy. But we automated that work. And people left the farm to go into the factory where the making of physical things, goods, became the basis of the industrial economy. But then we automated that work. And people left the factory to go into the service arena to the front counter, to the back office. So eventually a majority of people work in the delivery of services, performing activities on behalf of others in the service economy. And the whole point of our work in the experience economy is today we are automating services. We're automating services with the full force that we previously automated the industrial and the agrarian economies. Service jobs are going away. It's why we have real unemployment in this nation of well over 15% because we no longer count the people who aren't looking. Because we need to shift to an experience economy where what is bought and sold in commerce is people paying to spend time in places and events. And time is the currency of experiences. So when we're here to talk about design, my immediate reaction is to say, well, to design what? So let's come back to our progression of economic value. You see, commodities are natural stuff. You can't design a commodity. Iron ore is iron ore. Cotton is cotton. Coconut oil is coconut oil. It can't be designed. As soon as you refine it or process it, you turn it into a good. <clears throat> Goods are tangible things. Here we're talking about the design of, that deals with physicality, of embedding certain functions in particular features of a good. That's, a certain, that's old classic industrial design. Service design focuses on intangible activities. And because it's intangible, what you're really talking about is devising new processes, new ways work is performed on behalf of clients. And experiences are memorable events. 
And for Ameris, this is right down the middle of the plate. You've been here, but now the world has come to you. And what's involved in the designing of experiences, all are you, is different in kind. And by and large, even the design community doesn't fully understand this. Because in their heart of hearts, they want to design a toaster or a chair, a physical thing. And so there's great opportunity as you embrace design thinking to couple that, not with a, with a scientific understanding of human behavior, but also with the, with the art uh, of, of design. And we'll talk about that in a particular way here in a moment. What I'd like to do is talk about some goods, some services, experiences that illustrate not only the differences in designing goods versus services and experiences, but also to see how even the designers of goods and services are now thinking experientially. So my first goods example is Lego. I'm hard pressed to think of a physical good that is so elegantly designed. And you really can't improve upon it. If you were to change it, it wouldn't be a Lego. So if you look at the innovation and the design work of Lego today, their most recent offering is something called Life of George. It comes in a kit with some Lego pieces, and it's an app. And it basically starts off with one figure to make with the Legos that come with it. And you assemble it as quickly as possible, take a picture of it, and it will time how fast you made it. And it will give you the second image. And so you work on that as fast as you can, take a picture, and it times out, and the third one, and so forth, hundreds of these. I bought this for my uh, daughter. She spent the entire weekend plowing through every single design. And at the end, you can make your own, upload the image so that others can attempt to do it more quickly than you did. Think about what Lego has designed. They've designed the time spent experiencing the Legos. And that's what they're focused on today. Another goods manufacturer that I greatly admire is the Jules Stroller. Wonderfully designed stroller. Wonderful example of classic industrial design. But their latest innovation is actually the designing of their packaging. All of their corrugated containers can be repurposed to design another object, like a chair, like a peekaboo nook. So again, they're designing the experience of repurposing the packaging. Right? How novel and interesting is that? Let's turn to services. And let's look, look at just retail. Because retailing, the, the procurement and distribution and merchandising of goods is a huge sector of the service economy. And, and, and if there's ever a dinosaur better sameness, it's department stores. Can we all say in unison, Barney? <laughs> but interesting, look at some of the design innovation that's occurring here. Companies like Trunk Club. It's for men's fashion, where you go online and you become a member for a certain duration of time, fill out a profile, Based on that profile, we'll send you a box with an assortment of garments. Keep the ones you want to keep, mail back the others. Based on your selection, we'll update the profile so the next time they send you a box, it's more informed with your particular taste and so forth and so on. So this program, if you will, unfolds over a duration of time. They're customizing the service so that they have a unique wardrobe management experience versus walking into the same old department store. Let's turn to experiences. There's a Dutch company I've recently learned about that has combined the experience of a boat with the experience of a hot tub. It's a company called Hot Tug. <laughs> Maybe you'll incorporate it into some of your incentive programs. So here is a hot tug. <laughs> so yes, you're hot tugging while you go down the canals of Amsterdam. Perhaps take anchor at night opposite some windmill. Now that's a more sedate or passive experience, but how about a more active one? I've heard we might even have some tough mutters in the room. Do we have any tough mutters in the room? I can't tell you how many people tell me about this today. Right? This is basically the, the physical training of the British Special Forces repurposed as the, the most demanding uh, physical uh, contest you will ever endure. And I'm thinking, what if we were designed some incentive motivation programs with a tagline, are you tough enough? Let me give you a new paradigm. What if you had to actually overcome certain obstacles if you were to complete your way through the adventure or the program? Now, I don't know if I would press the point so far to make participants sign a death waiver, <laughs> as they do with Tough Mudder. But you can see, you talk about the attraction, the emotions of this. Right? You can see this is what people are drawn 
to say, this is what you're competing with in some measures, because you're all competing for how people spend time, the currency of experiences. Now we come back to progression of economic value, one word just jumps off the page as we talk about becoming designers, and that's the word stage. You see, you merely deliver a service, but you stage an experience. So if I give you that one word from, from my body of work, and now look at your company tagline, which I love. And to me, one word jumps off the page here. It's taking the science, your understanding your investment in that arena, and leveraging it, in fact, I would argue, manifesting it through art, and particularly the art of stagecraft. I'm delighted that uh, you're beginning to uh, embrace here Gene Lickers and Tim uh, uh, Ogilvie's uh, Designing for Growth. I teach at the University of Virginia. I'm a, a Batten fellow there. Gene Lickers is actually one of my, my top three friends on faculty at the University of Virginia. I love this book. It's a wonderfully accessible way of introducing design thinking to the business community. So I took my copy of the book off the shelf. And I'm going to do the, five, the four W questions to frame the rest of my, my, my time uh, with you. We'll take this one step at a time. First, we'll talk about what is. This is grounded in an understanding of what, are, what you're currently doing. And if you come back to this methodology, this framing that the gene provides, the very first tool that she suggests for understanding what is, is journey mapping. So here's a journey map from her book. It's a very simple journey map for illustrative purposes. This is a journey map of a young child preparing to go to school. The blue line is the emotional highs, the black line is the emotional lows. Very simple uh, model. I like to enrich that with some of my own tools that I uh, offer to you, and I've done this with a mutual client with Gene. So let me quickly go through our 4E model it's from chapter two of the book. If you're gonna pursue this, you have to go read about this model. Here's what I like to do with journey mapping, and I found it to be quite, quite fruitful exercise. Our four realms of experience are a uh, point of view that we have that the most engaging experiences, the most compelling experiences, richly draw from all four, from four different realms. So let me set up the model, then we'll talk about what the four realms are. First, this horizontal axis is the participation axis. Are your participants actively or passively participating in the program? If the program's in the woodwork, they're probably passive. Well, if I get it, get it. If I don't, I don't. I don't really notice. I don't really care. Or are they actively engaged in it? Secondly, is their relationship to the, the program one of absorbing it, or is it more immersive where they descend into it? With these two different dimensions, we can now define the four experiential realms. First, the entertainment realm. We believe engaging experiences are entertaining, they're fun and enjoyable. But I'm not talking about entertaining people, I'm talking about engaging them of which entertainment is a component, but not the entirety of what's required. Secondly, is the educational value of the experience. What do you learn from actually doing some activity? Thirdly, there's escapist value. That is being transported from one sense of reality to another. Tough mutter. And then finally, the escapist realm. This is the value of just being or hanging out. So four questions that I'd like to use initially for what is, and then transitioning to what if, or what could be. First, and then all of which combine to hit the sweet spot. First, what's enjoyable about the experience in terms of what is? What are people learning by being engaged in the experience? Thirdly, are we transporting them or having them go from one sense of reality to another? And then finally, is there value just in being in the program, hanging out, and belonging? to it. So four words, enjoy, learn, go be initially as what is questions, and then next as what if questions. <laughs> now we come to experience the map and we can make it far more interesting. We can look at what is in some programs you might have, and we can simply mm -hmm. plot over time the value in these four different dimensions. You ought to pick a program and go do that simple diagnostic on your own. If you want to practice, go to a mall or shop a store. Or, take, or if you want a dreadfully low curve, like take an airline flight with United uh, sometime. <laughs> <clears throat> I live in Cleveland. We used to have Continental. I'm just, uh, my life is becoming miserable over time. <laughs> Secondly, what if? <clears throat> what if? We devote three chapters in the experience economy. You have a picture here, our updated edition. We devote three chapters to the notion that work is theater. 
What if Merits was the company, above all others, that richly, comprehensively, robustly embraces theater as a business model for the experiences of the EMB stage? I think great things would happen. Let me just share a quote from one book we cite in one of those three chapters mm -hmm. on work as theater. That is Peter Brook's brilliant book, The Empty Space. This book is worth it just for the first sentence where Brooks writes, I can take any empty space and call it a bare stage. A man walks across that stage while another is looking, and that is all that is necessary for an act of theater to be engaged. You see, theater is how you rid yourself of better sameness. Even the performing arts, not better sameness unique theatrical performance, but not just Blue Man Group, the Geek Squad. Think of the costuming, the props. It's not some mundane, better, same as computer repair and installation. It's a theme experience that winks at Dragnet, that has as its organizing principle comedy with a straight face. And let me give you a tool for what if that Robert Stevens, the founder, shared with me. From the day he founded the company, he developed a giant don't list. He put down a list of all the things that traditional computer repair and installation companies normally do, and he didn't allow himself to do any of it. One of the things on his list is polo shirts. No polo shirts, that's why he has white uh, shirts, black clip-on ties. No minivans, geek mobiles. But if you ask him, you know, uh, comment with a straight face, you ask him, well, why clip-on ties? He'll tell you with a totally straight face. Same reason law enforcement wears them, in case there's an altercation. <laughs> it's an, an inherently more interesting experience because he's applied theater, right? Theater to the repair of computers. That's why in the last 10 years, while unemployment has gone down, they've gone from two dozen special agents when I met them over 10 years ago to now 25,000 Geek Squad agents roaming the planet in their 24-hour computer repair task force. <laughs> Even that language alone shows an appreciation for theater. What wows? I'm going to go through one model from my book here that will look more complicated than it actually uh, is. Um, it's actually a mid-19th century model from Gustav Freitag, who basically analyzed uh, uh, theater productions and said, why is it that certain performances are more compelling than others. What accounts for this? And he basically said, is if you plot complication over time, that's what accounts for this. So first there's the exposition. What's the play about? Or if you go to a new Bond movie, it's the opening five minutes. What, what city are we in? Who's the villain? What's about to happen? It establishes the context. Then there's the inciting incident. The action begins. Then there's the rising action. More and more things happen. More and more complication. Then there's the crisis. Very, very complicated. Which culminates in the climax, the climax can be defined as of all the things that could happen, only one thing does happen. After that, everything is falling action, and then finally the denouement or the return to normalcy. He argued that compelling performances have that structure. Now what application does this have to business? Well, let me share with you a meeting I once had at Kraft Foods with their advanced food group. I had a PhD in aroma psychology tell me that in blind test, taste tests, they know that Sanka tastes just as good as brewed coffee. I said, that's great, but I don't know anybody who drinks their coffee blindfolded. Because <laughs> their curve is like this. It's too simple. Rip it open, pour it in. It's not complicated enough. Versus this is the curve for Starbucks, especially when it's busy. You order, all those cups are there on the tray, and which one is mine? My friends, that is bad service. But it's a better experience. <laughs> and grounded in science, physiologically, the coffee tastes better by having to go through the angst of, oh, ah, mine. I'm dead serious there. All right, again, back to our mapping. So you ought to think about the design of your programs that mire some sort of fry tag curve. This is the Boston Marathon, by the way. It is. 18 miles, you're going to hit the hill. 
Heartbreak Hill, that's why it's the best marathon probably in the world. It has that kind of structure. All right, here's a piece of homework for you. Go to YouTube, watch the TED video of Dave Kahneman, type in experience versus memory of experience. Watch this TED talk on the riddle of experience versus the memory of experience. The, his talk is about whether you should design for the experience in the moment or whether you should design for the memory of the experience. And those are two different things. And the questions he raised, grounded in his science, questions which I believe he leaves unresolved, are answered by the Freitag chart. Watch it and see if you can see the connection. Let me conclude with what works. You know, how, are we gonna, how are we actually going to make an impact with our clients? How are you going to grow your business by breaking out of that you know, same old programs? Well, I reached to my shelf, and I, I haven't talked about this book in a long time. It's one of my favorite architecture books, A Theory for Practice, Bill Hubbard, Jr. This is a book written to architects. So by analogy here, think about architecture as just a subset of a broader design challenge. There's a book he writes to architects. He says, the problem with many architects is they think their job is to design a building. That's why so many of them are frustrated. Because your job is not to design a building. So that great architects manage a game of rock, scissors, paper. Where rock is a set of values that your client holds. Scissors are the money that they spend on the buildings they build. See, the values that your clients have will determine how much money they spend. The amount of money they spend will determine the buildings that they build. The buildings that are occupied will influence the values that they have, which will determine what kind of money they spend. And I can substitute incentive programs for buildings and challenge you all not just to design incentive programs, but to manage a game of rock, scissors, paper. If you do that, you will change the values of the companies and the clients you serve. And I'll take you to the fifth economic offering, is transformations. You won't help but transform the values and, yea, even the expenditures that we have, and thus you'll contribute to restoring economic prosperity that's so desperately needed in our times. How's that for a little profound ending? You like that one? That was good. <laughs> I don't normally do that. Yeah, tears. All right, thank you for having me. I look forward to uh, the rest of the day and hanging out with you tonight. Thank you so much.